I have a memory from my early childhood of standing at the back of a crowded hall. Almost everyone in the room seemed to be in some kind of trance. They sounded like they were singing random lyrics from strange languages. Their voices were loud, their arms were outstretched wide towards the ceiling, with heads tilted back and swaying from side to side. There was a band playing music without a melody, and a drummer was tapping a cymbal to make the sound of swelling waves. It could have been a jazz odyssey, except the crowd seemed to like it. Standing beside me was my father. He was doing exactly what everybody else was doing, only louder and more vigorously. He never did like to be outdone. I was an outsider. I wasn't experiencing what everybody else seemed to be experiencing. Not only was I incapable of joining in, I don't think I wanted to. This was a typical experience for me. Most weeks I had been taken along to a meeting like this. These experiences got me thinking, why was I different? Was it something about me? Perhaps it was something about them. This sparked my interest in the relationship between beliefs and how we think about evidence. There are two questions I've been thinking about for most of my life. The first question is, how can two people look at the same evidence and come to opposite conclusions? The second question is, why do people respond to evidence so differently? Well, what I mean by this is some people are very easily swayed by weak evidence. And other people seem immune to strong evidence. To gain some insights, I've been seeking out conversations with people I disagree with. At first, these conversations went terribly. They would descend into arguments where we threw evidence at each other, even to the point where we became incapable of listening. One of the unusual things I noticed was, as the quality of evidence increased, the civility of the discussion tended to decrease. I would table what I thought was a particularly good piece of evidence or reason, and then get upset when they dismissed it without consideration. If I didn't agree with them as to what they thought was good evidence or reason, they might call me arrogant, ignorant, stupid, or a fool. If I got really upset, I might call them cognitively inflexible. <laughs> Recently, I've been getting better at these conversations. It's not because I'm a good listener or skilled communicator. I found that by introducing two things early into a dialogue, I could help steer conversations away from arguments and more towards good faith exchanges. First, I acknowledge that I could be wrong. I use a number to indicate my degree of confidence in my position, similar to a scale from zero to 100%. And second, I clearly state the intention to change my position if the evidence requires it. I'm not the first person to think of this. However, it has helped make my conversations more reasonable and productive. Now, one of my standout dialogues was a six-month correspondence with the Flat Earther. <laughs> it was more enlightening than productive. The difference in our worldviews was so polar opposite, we couldn't even agree on the number of poles. His worldview was conspiratorial, with a cover-up by shadowy elites as to the true shape of the Earth. I once went into depth with him about how tides work and how this provides strong evidence for a globe-shaped Earth that rotates. This is when it became apparent to me he was very selective about what he considered reliable evidence. He dismissed the evidence I put forward as NASA corrupted globe science. We both watched a video filmed from a camera attached to a weather balloon. It rises to 32,000 meters. To him, it revealed a flat Earth. But when I watched it, I could see a slight curve. We were both watching the same video and seeing two different types of world. We'd been writing to each other for months. I knew he wasn't stupid. Intelligence wasn't the issue. He knows more than I do about astronomy and cosmology. However, he thinks it's all lies that I've swallowed whole. The beliefs of a flat earther may seem irrational to us. As I've researched how beliefs are formed, I've started to conclude 
that very few of our beliefs are formed from a rational process. Instead, it seems our beliefs tend to mirror the pronouncements of people we trust. These pronouncements fit with our pre-existing worldview. Our worldview alters our view of the world. What do I mean by this? To me, it neatly sums up the role of our pre-existing beliefs and their impact on our ability to examine new evidence. What we expect to see plays a key role in what we perceive. In cognitive psychology, this is called top-down processing. Whilst awake, our brains are near constantly being bombarded with information. This information may be useful, irrelevant, misleading, and can even be harmful. We make sense of new information by putting it in the context of what we already know. You're doing this right now with every idea I'm trying to convey to you, whether you take it on board or reject it, is due in part to how it aligns with your pre-existing worldview. Top-down processing also plays a role in judging someone by their appearances. That's why I considered buying a pair of long trousers and shoes for today. <laughs> I thought that wearing shorts and work boots may lead to negative preconceptions. I decided against this, as I suspect part of the reason you're here today and listening to me speak is to have your preconceptions challenged. I don't think my flat earther friend was interested in having his preconceptions challenged. Early in our correspondence, I introduced the two things I mentioned a few minutes ago. I acknowledged that I could be wrong by stating confidence in my position of around 98%. <laughs> the 2% uncertainty allowed me and helped me to consider the reasons and evidence he put forward fairly. I asked him what degree of confidence he had in his position. He said he was 100% certain the earth was flat. After stating that I would change my position if the evidence requires it, I asked him what kind of evidence could change his position. He said any evidence for a globe-shaped earth is fabricated because the earth is flat. I think his absolute certainty makes him immune to counter-evidence. In his book, Mental Immunity, Dr. Andy Norman describes a concept he calls reason's fulcrum. A simple lever only has two parts. There's the beam, which is straight and also well, is rigid and usually straight. Here I'm using a board. And the fulcrum. It sits under the beam and provides a point to pivot on. Levers are used to shift heavy loads, although they can be used as a scale to balance two objects. A playground seesaw is a type of simple lever. Dr. Norman points out that reasons and evidence can't change our minds if we don't let them. We need a willingness to allow our minds to be changed. This willingness is like a fulcrum. Without a fulcrum, we don't have a lever. We just have a board. Without a willingness to allow our minds to be changed, reasons and evidence can't exert any leverage on our beliefs. He suggests that we observe a new rule. Thou shalt yield to better reasons. Without this rule, our thinking can become inward-focused, self-validating. This can enhance polarization. I reached out to Dr. Norman to see if we could extend on his idea. I thought that by positioning the fulcrum according to our degree of confidence in a belief, it could better represent the relationship between beliefs and how we think about evidence. If we move the fulcrum all the way to one end, we no longer have a lever. We've built a ramp. If this happens, no amount of evidence can alter or change the belief. Just like I found with my flat earther friend, the evidence just seems to slide off. Dr. Norman saw my point and we started working together to flesh this concept out. I'm going to use this concept to demonstrate one way we can respond to evidence. It's a tool for being less wrong. Before I get started, I'm going to call the belief that we're examining a claim. Beliefs are complicated things that come with all sorts of baggage. Claims, on the other hand, are a little more specific and easier to examine. The weights 
will represent evidence. If they're applied to the lever unevenly, the fulcrum must move to keep the lever in balance. If your confidence in your, your positions always remains the same as new evidence comes to light, you're either always right or you need to pay close attention. Here's an example of how this works. Imagine living about two and a half thousand years ago and trying to evaluate the new claim by Pythagoras that the Earth was a globe. He didn't have good evidence for this. He thought that a sphere was a perfect shape that would suit the Earth. If this was the only reason to think the Earth was a globe, it could be reasonable to think the Earth was probably flat. Not long after, Empedocles observes a lunar eclipse. He notices that the shape of the shadow cast on the moon by the Earth was the kind of shadow cast by a globe. Now, this was a really strong piece of evidence, strong enough for us to go from thinking the Earth is probably flat to being unsure. To make this as simple as possible, let's say at the time the evidence for and against the claim that the Earth was a globe was exactly the same. I'm representing this by two weights of the same mass. The ratio of evidence is one to one. This means the ratio of our confidence is one to one. The two sections of the board either side of the balancing point here at our fulcrum are the same length. The section on your left represents our confidence in the claim. It's half of the length of the board. Half is 0.5 or 50%. That's how confident we should be in a claim where the evidence is just as likely to be observed that the claim is true as if it's false. Later, Aristotle observed that the changing view of the stars, depending from where on Earth they were viewed from, is what you would expect if you were viewing from a globe. Also, early navigators noticed as they sailed towards land, the tips of mountains and hills could be seen first. They appeared to rise out of the ocean as they sailed towards them, just as you would expect if you were sailing on a globe. Together, this was very strong evidence, although we must view new evidence in the context of what we already know. To keep this simple, let's say the new evidence nudges our ratio up taking us from one to one to two to one. This means that the evidence is twice as likely to be observed from a globe-shaped Earth than from a flat Earth. The ratio of evidence is two to one. So the ratio of our confidence is two to one. The section aboard on the left that represents our confidence in the claim is two parts of three. Two out of three ain't bad, but it is approximately 0.67 or 67%. That's how confident we should be in a claim if it's twice as likely to be observed, the evidence is twice as likely to be observed if the claim is true than if it's false. Obviously, as time goes by, the evidence for a globe-shaped Earth accumulates. When I said I have a confidence of about 98%, I'm saying I think the ratio of evidence is approximately 49 to 1. Now, what I'm about to say contains some technical terms. Don't worry if you can't follow it. It's going to take about 40 seconds, and then I'll begin to sum up. What I've demonstrated is the Bayes factor expressed as an odds ratio. The weight on your right is the probability of evidence given the hypothesis multiplied by its prior. The weight on the left is the probability of evidence given the null multiplied by its prior. The position of the fulcrum gives us our posterior credence in our two competing hypotheses. Just as with the lever, Bayes' theorem stops working if we set our prize to zero or one. When I said our worldview alters our view of the world, it's just another way of saying our prior affects our posterior. OK, that's the technical bit out of the way. As a child, I hated feeling like an outsider at all the meetings I was taken to. There was a period in my late teens and early 20s where I tried to fit in, and I joined the membership of a, 
a fair few of these groups. At least one of them could have been defined accurately as a cult. Then there was a period for years where I was openly hostile towards groups of people who had beliefs that I didn't think were supported by the evidence. Now, when I apply the principles that I've been talking about, I've found I'm enjoying the, the company of people who I disagree with and have beliefs that I don't hold. Sometimes I even go along to their meetings, still trying to gain insights into those same two questions. How can two people look at the same evidence and come to opposite conclusions? And why do we respond to evidence so differently? I think a big part of the answer lies in two very simple things. First, a willingness to change our minds. And second, avoid absolute certainty. Our worldview alters our view of the world. I propose by allowing a little uncertainty into our worldview, our view of the world can become a little more panoramic. Thank you. <laughs>